Uh, I'm going to present my recent work, a deep learning framework for solution and material characterization in mechanics. I'm going to explain each part of this long title, deep learning, what is it? Uh, what do I mean by solution and material characterization? Um, hopefully through this talk. Um, so this particular work, today's presentation, is in collaboration with my former advisor at MIT, Ruben Juanes, and uh, uh, Mazia Raisi, who is an assistant professor now at Colorado Boulder University. And also different parts of the presentation goes to uh, Professor Gomez from Purdue University and Professor Madensi from University of Arizona. I will uh, refer to their work in different parts. So I'd like to thank you them as well. Uh, I first start with my personal motivation. Why am I doing this at all? And which part of this topic was uh, of my interest? So my grad studies and especially my PhD was more on numerical modeling uh, with emphasis on geometries, where I studied mostly finite elements uh, and then extended finite element to capture fractures and um, uh, discontinuity, some mesh-free works, and also on the constitutive modeling side to be able to model localization and fracking uh, under dry conditions and coupled conditions. Uh, after my PhD, I joined uh, Forming Technologies, a finite element company in Burlington, Ontario, where uh, they were kind of designing um, software for simulation of uh, um, sheet metal to be able to form, for example, a door or some other part of the car uh, or airplane from sheet metal. So this is the process. You have a die, you have a punch, and one part is moving. The uh, plate is initially flat, and then it goes through the forming process, and that's the final shape. And uh, so it was mostly development of a new finite element solver that I did, and also some um, larger scale high performance computing for larger scale problems. But what got my attention was first of all, this problem, it was using it, uh, they were using it for real applications on assembly lines. So, and uh, what was very interesting for me uh, as modeling and I don't know for research part was this uh, change in coefficient of friction um, over time these parts they accumulate metal dust and the coefficient of friction is changing and that changes the whole simulation process and I was wondering if from uh, their automated validation process we can incorporate that in the modeling and that was some motivation for uh, two other aspects of simulation, uh, one on a stochastic modeling and the other part on data incorporation. So these, in in an assembly line, they have all these camera setups that automatically validate or invalidate a car, a, a part, uh, after forming. So they have that data, but it's not trivial how to use it in a finite element setup. I think in experiments, we also do have a lot of data. We can install a lot of sensors but it's not trivial how to connect it to an actual solver. So that was motivation for me to go for a postdoc. I started in MIT at uh, 2007. Main work was on uh, uh, modeling of, uh, through geomechanical modeling essentially, assessment of induced seismicity due to CO2 sequestration and uh, gas injection and production. And this was one of the particular uh, projects that I led uh, everything and uh, this is a gas reservoir around one of the main uh, municipals in North America and essentially uh, the idea is that if there is an earthquake and this is one of the active falls um, if there is an earthquake and these wells one of them or a few of them uh, they due to shearing if they fail how much gas leaks to the fault and how much to the surface. To the surface is important because there is a chance for uh, explosion and so on, but to the fault is also important because when you change the pore pressure, 
uh, essentially you are changing the state of stress and you may cause earthquake. And then uh, I set up this automated system so that we can do a stochastic modeling and we can come up with some risk assessment, probability of leakage to the fault and to the surface. What is the probability for a five year, 10 year earthquake or 500 year earthquake? And the last piece of this computational word puzzle kind of for me was where is data? How, how can I incorporate data? And that's the focus of today's talk, uh, results of last two years of uh, research and uh, study. So on the scientific side, I think this is very important because uh, especially geological models, but most engineering problems, uh, a lot of engineering problems are large scale, highly heterogeneous and nonlinear due to all the complexities that exist. Um, how can we do some inversion in these systems? Inversion is important because when we are designing a system, when we are designing a dam, for example, or a building, as engineers, we make some assumptions. But the actual construction process, what happens then, there might be an earthquake a few years later. What those processes do to, uh, to the structure? And does it change the uh, parameters uh, of the system and that they were designed based on and if it changes how much. So this is very uh, complex um, numerically because if you want to do inversion uh, essentially what these current methods are um, let's say you only have elasticity you have different um, parts of system but it's only elastic so if you have, I don't know, three parts, this is the set of parameters of the system. You need to do some finite element simulations every time you make a perturbation to every uh, individual of these parameters. And then through a gradient descent learning, you can eventually update. But if it's a really complex problem, already simulations take few hours, if not days, how can you do that? It becomes very expensive and it's a lot of uh, manual manipulation. Also, some problems are poorly constrained. For example, this simple bar, if we only have access to readings from, I don't know, a displacement center, sensor at the top, this is unconstrained. There are many combinations of this elasticity modulus and Poisson ratio that can uh, generate essentially the same displacement field at top. So, um, I don't look at the second problem. For now, we assume that, okay, the data exists, but the second problem, uh, the second point is really a big problem in many engineering. So, mm, yeah, most problems are complex and the classical methods are uh, expensive, if not it's interactive. And then on the other side, there has been a lot of work over the many decades and perhaps centuries. And there is on physical side, on modeling of these phenomena, coming up with some physical laws that govern these systems, conservation of mass, momentum, heat, and a lot of work on constitutive models. So some of them are good and uh, we should take advantage of them. So how can we, can we have a framework that can take advantage of data, also governing equations over time can adapt to um, more data sets and so on. And the answer seems to be yes, this is a new uh, uh, paradigm uh, through deep learning essentially. Um, deep learning has been used for engineering systems uh, for a while, but the main uh, topic, kind of the main set of uh, papers that are very promising are these recent works from 2015-16 when uh, Google and a couple of other companies, Microsoft, they open sourced the code and they gave access and they did a lot of progress on um, use of deep learning for autonomous driving for many other uh, problems. So in engineering and science, people have started looking back into these uh, methods. Uh, however, uh, there are papers on neural network, for example, for geomaterial modeling back in 95 even. They were not successful back then for a couple of reasons. 
and that I try to uh, address during this talk. But essentially, these are some data-driven models, meaning that, for example, in this work, uh, they do a lot of finite element simulation and they fit a neural network so that they can act, they can predict this, um, the state of the system immediately. So training is very uh, slow on deep learning, but evaluation is very fast. That's why we have autonomous driving. So once the network is trained, you can immediately uh, evaluate it. And they used it for evaluation of the state of the fault. This one was for uh, constructing a neural network to predict earthquakes from experiments. And this is for earthquake prediction again. A set of new works also came in over these uh, last two years that I was also lucky to study this topic at the same time and uh, they caught my attention. One was from Professor Karniadeki's group in the Applied Math Department of Brown University. The other main work was from uh, Professor Nathan Kutz and uh, uh, Steve Brunton from uh, University of Washington. So they tried to also incorporate physics right into the deep learning process. And this combination is the one that uh, I also used for mechanics and I also tried to make some uh, contributions there. So in summary, uh, what can be done is, if you have a deep learning framework, um, if you don't have any physics, you need a lot of data set. But if you have that data set, essentially you can construct some really accurate neural networks. If you don't have that data set, the advantage is that you can start with some physical constraints that is like free data. It's not perfect, but you can still construct such models. And over time, when there are more sensors, more readings, you can uh, replace them. And this is a great advantage of this tool. So the outline, I'm gonna explain uh, what is deep learning and what is essentially physics-informed deep learning and how it can be applied to some of the problems in engineering. So deep learning is a subset of machine learning and uh, machine learning itself is a subset of artificial intelligence. So uh, machine learning has multiple approaches, um, support vector machines, uh, bootstrapping and many other approaches. And essentially the difference is how you construct the approximation space. Deep learning means that we do machine learning using neural networks. I'm going to explain what is neural network, but um, it means that approximation functions are constructed using some neural network. So deep learning has two aspects. One is constructing an approximation function for the problem of interest. And then the other side is learning or training or essentially optimization, finding the parameters of that approximation. So if we have a field variable of interest, let's say temperature or anything, I don't know, some chemical concentration, we have some measurements. We know that there is a true solution for that, but we don't know what is this true solution. We want to approximate it with some approximation function. And we have been really doing this. So we can do a linear regression, right? We can do a quadratic regression. Or we can construct it with a neural network. So what I want to say here is that the approach remains the same. So first you make some hypothesis about, um, about this approximation you say, okay, my system is gonna behave linearly, quadratically, or with some complex neural network. And, but now once you decide on that, now you need to find this A1, A0, or W and Bs in neural network and so on. And that is done through uh, optimization. So the most popular approach is mean squared error. Probably most of you have used it. If you have done any linear fitting in MATLAB or Excel or whatever, that's the approach that is being used. So you have a data set uh, at certain 
axis, you have some values for temperature or concentration of some chemical. And then the approximation that you choose also gonna give you some numbers if you replace them at those locations. And essentially this gives you an error initially because the state initially is random. And then you're gonna minimize this, you're gonna find a way to, so that this function becomes, it takes its minimum value. And then we say, okay, that's the best we can get with this approximation. And the minimization is usually with the gradient descent update, right? You take the derivative of this loss with respect to parameters of the system, Ws and Bs, and then you just update it. So all these algorithms now are implemented in TensorFlow and Keras, and they can be used readily. So uh, the takeaway from this is that, uh, from this slide is that one side is the choice of approximation, whether linear, whether neural network. The other side is optimi optimization and finding these parameters. I should add that the simplest neural network actually is a linear regression. So we're gonna see it here. So how to construct a neural network? You have a set of inputs, x1, x2, x3, and so on. You create a linear combination of them. This is a linear combination of x uh, inputs. And you pass it through activation function, like a sine, cosine, or just take the positive part. You can do many things. And then that gives us some output. So if we just stop here, and if we choose this activation function, if we just choose it to be linear or remove it altogether, then this is a linear regression problem. So the simplest neural network is just a linear regression, but, but you can do more complex things here automatically without any effort. So you can take the output of this, send it to a new layer, and repeat this many times. And what's gonna happen is, especially with deep neural network, which means you have four layers or more, you're gonna construct this very nonlinear functional space, and essentially you can fit it to any problem. There is a paper um, by Horkin, uh, 1989, that proves that a multi-layer neural network can approximate any measurable functions. And what it shows that if it's not converging, if it's not a good fit, it's because the choice of features are not good or the optimization is not good. And that's what we have also in engineering. We have been using this. When you want to, I don't know, correlate elasticity modulus to some parameters of the system, we try to see which feature or which uh, parameters of the system are in, in the independent variables. They are most affecting the elasticity modulus. So the ones that are irrelevant, we should not keep the, for example, elasticity modulus as a function of those. Otherwise, uh, there is the not a good correlation between them. So the, it's the same concept here. We have to be careful of choice of these features. So in the context of image processing, uh, what they have been doing, for example, I don't know, this image has a dot, you take a part of it and that becomes one feature. So you either you can take a mean value, a Gaussian kernel or something like that. That becomes your features and then you train it to classify this image for you and eventually gives you whether it's a cat, dog, so on. We can replace these images, I don't know, with some um, concrete wall and this neural network automatically tells us whether it's cracked or not. That can be used for health monitoring and that type of things. So if we choose this network, the inputs and outputs in a particular way, so if we choose the inputs to be space and time, and the outputs to be, for example, some physical variables, displacement stresses, what happens is, we are essentially constructing an approximation for these physical quantities. And the interesting part is that we can take now derivative of u with respect to x, derivative of u with respect to y and t. 
And this is what uh, was done just recently, 2019. And they found that if they use this architecture, this set of inputs and outputs, then they can incorporate those physical laws in the loss function. So they can essentially put the Navier-Stokes equation into the loss along with the data. And they showed that it can uh, find the parameters of this uh, Newtonian fluid. So that caught my attention and um, uh, I saw it when it was archived. So I started uh, exploring it for solid mechanics problem and uh, it became the result of this presentation. So this was one of the first problem I looked at. Um, so the problem itself was set up, uh, this is, it has an analytical solution. It was set up by Hector Gomez. And uh, uh, what we are looking at, so this is a problem subjected to these boundary conditions and this is the analytical solution for it. So displacement components, strains, and stresses. So this is the analytical solution, and we have the analytical solution for it. But think about this. For this analytical solution, think for or for this domain, think we have only hundred sensors, only hundred sensors installed. Maybe some experimentalists say, oh, only. Yeah, I know, maybe for some systems, uh, 100 is a lot, for some systems is less, but anyway, let's say we have 100 sensors and we can measure all these parameters. So we have a discrete data set containing displacements, strains, and stresses. So it's discrete, it's just 100 points, right? We want to fit, we want to find what is the physics associated with it meaning that what was the elasticity modulus of this system? What is the shear modulus of this system? That's the, our objective. So we only have 100 data points and we want to fit physics to it. How do we do it? So we construct this physics informed neural network. The inputs are space, the outputs are displacement field, stresses, and we can incorporate also parameters, uh, these LAME parameters, lambda and mu shear modulus and a lemma parameter as a, also a network parameter and they all go to this loss function so loss now has a data driven part so this is we had only 100 points data for displacement for example for stresses or can be for strains doesn't matter so this is the data driven part and we can also incorporate physics this is the momentum equation you just use the momentum equation right away in the loss. And then this is the linear elasticity relations. We can put it there. And these lambda and mu also, they have, initially they have just random numbers. And now you train the network, not only it learns what was the true solution. So this is the solution that comes out of training from that hundred points. But also it tells us that Okay, it was from a solid mechanics with these two parameters. So the parameters, we are letting them to train. We put these equations in, but the parameters are free to change. And then, so this was very interesting. I did a lot of studies on convergence. Um, there are two common activation functions so that these networks become nonlinear. One is ReLU. So you just get rid of the negative outputs. One is tangent hyperbolic. So ReLU is not very well suited, as you can see here, for the physics-informed networks because um, uh, here we are working with derivatives, momentum equation, you need to take derivatives and so on, and ReLU doesn't have uh, continuous derivatives. So I found that it never works. But tangent hyperbolic, especially for this a smooth problem with pretty much any choice of layers and neurons, it worked very nicely. Um, I studied sensitivity to noise in the uh, data that I'm feeding in, um, and essentially it wasn't sensitive at all to a small noise, but if I feed in a wrong solution, if I, sorry, feed in a wrong data, so a data that does not match that set of equation, 
So just remember that we have two parts in the loss, right? One is data driven, the other part is physics. If this part, for some reason, does not match this part, then they become competing terms. One is pushing the optimizer to go in certain direction, the other pushes the optimizer to go in another direction. And the result is that it cannot converge. And that's what we found. So this one did not converge. Uh, we did some transfer learning. Transfer learning means that uh, you first train a neural complex neural network on a well um, instrumented system. So you have a lot of data there, you can train it there. Now you wanna go to a new system with new parameters, but very similar. So they are both, I don't know, porous media, for example, or concrete, but one is highest strength, one is uh, regular. Some has, one has some chemical more than the other, something like this. So they are close overall, but not the same. So you train it on one that you know very well, you have a lot of data set, it takes you this many rounds of training, this blue one. It takes you maybe, I don't know, um, 2,000 seconds or so for this particular problem that we are looking at. Then you take the parameters and you go now to the new system. You fit it with much less data and new data and the training is done much faster and you get the parameters also much faster. The error also starts at much lower. So this was also interesting. Transfer learning is commonly used in search engines and e-commerce. For example, Amazon, I don't know, looks at the sales in last fall and whatever they train for their neural networks, they can take the weights and use it in the fall 2020 and hoping that it can do a good prediction. And once the data actually comes in, they can also adapt it to this 2020 data. Well, this year is a special year, so <laughs> maybe uh, those trained models based on 2019 uh, don't work well, but uh, that's the idea here. We also looked at sensitivity analysis, so surrogate modeling. In sensitivity analysis, you want to understand sensitivity of response of your system with respect to some parameters. So this is also a very expensive simulation. You need to do many simulations usually to come up with any meaningful result. With physics informed, um, because we are also imposing the physics in the loss and these derivatives play a huge role. With physics informed, we were able to um, with only four data set, construct this continuous functional form for all the fields. So only four data sets at these uh, shear modulus values. These are non-dimensional values. And um, being able to evaluate it on a continuous range. And the error is very low on many parameters and in the maximum ranges, uh, they become about 25% or slightly more. Um, I checked the data demand, how much data is needed. So um, certainly we don't need 600 by 600, even for a grid of 100 by 100 data points, it can find the uh, parameters correctly, just because physics imposes a significant amount of constraint to the system, and which is an advantage in the beginning we may not have a lot of data sets. And also I looked at like a geological setup where installing sensors on the surface is very easy, but subsurface is not as easy because um, of, yeah, the, all the connections and what you need set of wheels and also here it worked very well. So this work is submitted a while ago, but uh, the a few months ago, but the um, uh, preprint uh, can be uh, looked at here. So we went f uh, around this. I also created a um, kind of open source tool, uh, Cyan, 
and try to address some of the things differently than the original work by Professor Karniadek's group. One of them, for example, if you look at this Navier-Stokes equation, uh, so the problem is as follows. We have a velocity field. It's from some velocity field data set essentially is given to us from some image correlation technique. And uh, uh, they want to know what is the fluid. First, is it Newtonian or not? If it's Newtonian, this lambda one should become one when you are also imposing Navier-Stokes equations. And then what is the kinematic viscosity of that? So what I find is that for different parameters, because they are not necessarily on the same dimension, one is, for example, velocity field, one is pressure. If we separate the networks, if we put in individual networks rather than just one fully connected, the convergence is much better. And this code was, or this package was developed with that in mind. And we can see that we are able to find uh, as kind of, uh, so the discrete data, we assume that uh, we have 5,000 data points over um, uh, space and time. So it's about um, 200 points in a space and then at different time spots. That's uh, not something very significant from uh, image correlation techniques. And uh, it can, but when you impose the data and when you impose Navier-Stokes equation, so it finds the parameters accurately and also it finds the solution. So now this is like a, a functional form. You can now put any time and evaluate it, whether it's performing fine or not. I also apply it to uh, some nonlinear mechanics where the solution is uh, smooth or uh, just standard care fitting. I think deep learning is also a better approach for just a standard care fitting. Just remember that uh, the simplest neural network is just a linear regression. So these new packages, they are designed to work on large data sets. So if you're if you just need a linear regression, but you think at some point you're gonna have a data set with 10 million components or 100 million components, which is not that uncommon. If you have a time series with a frequency of 100 Hertz uh, and you have multiple variables, so it's not that uncommon. Uh, with that amount of data, either you have to throw them away or uh, with Excel, for example, it's not a, a um, easy uh, trip. But these frameworks, they are designed to do that. They are automatically cutting the data, doing the training for you, and so on. So on the challenge side, so this one so far worked very well on these problems. But I went to another problem where we have a little bit of singularity, <laughs> maybe because of my background on, I don't know, localization and fracture. So I like this problem. and. Uh, this is an indenta indentation problem or like foundation loading. And what may happen is you may have some localization if you have plastic deformation or uh, just simply uh, esterous concentration or singularity. At this point that um, uh, two type of boundary conditions uh, meet each other. So and here we have displacement boundary condition, here we have zero flux boundary condition. At the point of intersection, a usually continuum mechanics uh, results in singularity. So this is the true solution. As you can see, uh, we have some stress singularity here, especially on the shear side. And when I fit the pin model, um, I see that the error is relatively high, especially around this point of singularity. So it finds the parameters relatively good, at least for this elasticity. For the plasticity, it failed. I'm gonna show it in the next slides. But you can see that the source is around this point of concentration. So this was a motivation to see whether we can resolve this issue and we can uh, find a solution. 
And the same time, uh, so that's where my collaboration with Dr. Madensi started. So he was visiting MIT and he had, uh, he is the uh, kind of, he has been working on peridynamics for a while and uh, he's also a lead author of a couple of peridynamics books. And he was presenting a peridynamic approach and um, uh, that's, uh, we got some ideas and we started some collaboration. And essentially the idea is as follows. So pure peridynamic is proposed by Sealing initially uh, from Sandia National Labs. And it was designed to take long range interactions. And this is a common issue for if you are analyzing at uh, sub micro scale uh, or um, for fracture propagation, essentially the uh, fracture is a non-local phenomena. And they were developing a new framework other than continuum mechanics to capture fracking. Uh, so it turned out by this uh, paper from uh, Dr. Madensi and his collaborators that uh, if you approximate a function at any point with just Taylor series, and if you do a few steps, so if you assume a um, polynomial approximation uh, for interaction between these points and then if you integrate it over this domain. So this gray domain is called domain of interaction for this red dot. So we allow that this red dot not only sees these neighbors but also a little bit further through this interaction function. So if you define it this way and then if you put it back, multiply both sides of this Taylor series by this peridynamic approximation, then, uh, so note that this A's, these are some coefficients that are unknown. So we have to find a way to, to um, uniquely identify them. So if you just multiply this function by Taylor series and uh, one way, and then integrate it over the domain of interest. One way to uniquely define A's is by imposing the uh, orthogonality condition on polynomials. So if you impose that, then you have a unique value for A's. So this is just a way to construct some approximation here. What it allows you to do is you can replace any derivative with integration. So derivative usually makes it if you have a data set, it makes it more noisy. Integration, it makes it a smoother. And um, that was their contribution that if you follow this approach, you can uh, come up with this integral for the derivatives. And uh, essentially, if you choose the domain of interaction to be circular, you can recover this original peridynamic non-local theory that was pure mechanical, so by the interaction and equilibrium forces and so on. So for me, this was interesting because now I can find the mathematical way to uh, interact multiple points in the network. And I think that singularity problem is because um, those single values, they are not enough. Uh, for the network to see what is happening at those narrow bands of stress concentration. So what we ended up proposing is as follows. Um, so original work by uh, for pin f is just a function of local x. Now we are constructing f, so temperature at any given point, not only as a function of that point, but also a neighborhood of that. And the complexity is what are these G's that we find it from peridynamic. So uh, once we do that, now if I go back to this problem that I showed you earlier, so initially there was these points of singularity and you were seeing this error, we can improve the error significantly. On the inversion side, so you can see here that, so white is the perfect color, means true value. So you can see that Still, there is some error. It's not much, but there is some error here. But these two are purely white. So by using this architecture. So we also, I also used it for nonlinear when we have 
not only elasticity modulus, but a work hardening um, elasticity. So there is a yield stress and there is a hardening parameter. And I can also invert that problem perfectly. So oh, I started with this, and as you can see, pin was missing the hardening parameter completely. And I spent a lot of time to solve this with pin, and it didn't work. And uh, this non-local theory was the solution for that. So in conclusion, what I see so far over this uh, year and a half or two years of uh, studying this topic is uh, PIN framework shows uh, promise for solution and identification of mechanics uh, on a smooth problems, essentially. Uh, it is a unified framework to incorporate data and physics at the same time. It is not very sensitive to noise, but of course, if the data does not match the physics that we assume, then uh, it never finds a way to, I don't know, finds a balance between these two. So in a way it is good because it points us that maybe something is missed uh, uh, from um, our model. And then it is a potentially good tool for surrogate modeling because you need less data because of all the constraints those derivatives put on the system. And then PDO pin, this peridynamic one, uh, we also find that, okay, if there is points of singularity, now there is a mathematical way to, uh, to uh, give network more non-locality kind of uh, architecture. And in, it is able to capture high gradients and singularity. And with that, I would like to thank you all for Mm, uh, listening to this talk in this uh, timing and if you have any questions uh, you can ask now or you can later email me thanks thank you very very much really wonderful